first of all, artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> as Steve referred to, there are a lot of different definitions. For us, artificial intelligence is about getting computers to behave in more intelligent or better ways without direct human intervention. So the old style computer programming means you have to explicitly give every single direction to the computer and that's the only thing it's capable of. Classic AI approaches let us move beyond that so they could do things like pathfinding and uh, constraint satisfaction, different techniques for dealing with. Still, you have to give it the instructions about how to solve the problem, but we can use, we don't have to be explicit about each step taken. So my example for that is if you're walking through a maze, you don't have to say take the first right and then the second left and then go straight for a while because that would only work for one exact maze but we can program systems that can find their way through a maze. In that case, it's called search. It's one of the classic AI fields, purely in artificial intelligence. So this has become so ubiquitous, we don't even think of it as requiring intelligence anymore. Google Maps will find us a path from A to B and we get grumpy if it's not the best path. It's actually, to solve this perfectly in all cases, it's a hard problem, but luckily, when we're talking about human scale distances, we don't have to consider too much. Machine learning is a subset of AI. So machine learning is the subset of AI that's specifically concerned with learning from data, finding patterns in data and using that to create more general systems. We refer to these as question answering machines. The technical term is models, but uh, we like describing things in ways that are kind of as apparent as possible. So the best way to think about what, ha what machine learning does or how you might want to apply it is think of a question you want answered and we're going to magically or not so magically build you a machine to answer that question and only that question. So like I said, machine learning centers around this idea of a question answering machine and you should always, always, always start with thinking about how you want to use it and how you're going to use it because like I said, machine learning all about the data is you're going to take your operational data, this is the live data, this is what you're experiencing as you're actually using the system in production, what your customers are feeding into the system. Whatever that operational data is, it gets fed into the question answering machine, out pops an answer. If you've done your job right, the answer is correct or mostly correct or to the MVP level of accuracy. If you've done your job wrong poorly, then it's uh, potentially disastrous. That's the using it process. In order to get to this point, I just asserted you have this magic question answering machine. So how do you get there? And that's the arduous process that is incredibly painful if you don't have data and can take years to get the accuracy you want. Or it can take weeks and there's no way to know until you try. To build the question answering machine is where the science, the field of machine learning comes in. And that comes down to the learning algorithm. And for our purposes, you can think of the learning algorithm as a more or less black box that you have to take a bunch of learning data in, feed it into the learning algorithm, out pops the model. The model is what you distribute. The model is your question answering machine. Any questions? This very high level explanation. Because I'm a more general question answering machine. My accuracy isn't as high on some things, but. Okay. The other term that gets confused in this uh, age of hype around artificial intelligence is data science. Data science is another field of study. It has huge overlap with machine learning, but they're not the same. Data science is about extracting insights from data. We use a ton of the same techniques between machine learning and data science, but the end result of machine learning is this idea of creating that question answering machine the end result of data science is better insights from the data. When you're doing data science, you can look at all the data you have. When you're doing machine learning, it's a very easy mistake to make and is made all the time that you take all your data, you feed it into the learning algorithm, you get a model and you say, this model has some level of accuracy. It does not because there's no way the computer can protect against just memorizing the correct answers from the data you fed it. Uh, this will probably come up again. So, uh, and feel free to interject if you have questions about it. We share a lot of the same models. We've discovered a lot of the same things, but they're different but overlapping fields. I saw a hand. Yeah. 
An example of overlapping between machine learning and, and data science? What's pure? Most of data mining is. I mean, the, the terms shift day to day. For example, principal component analysis, has anyone used that or heard of it? PCA analysis? Has anyone called Linprog in an Excel spreadsheet? Has anyone fit a best, uh, drawn a line in a graph to make a, lo a line that fits the data points most of all? At any point, high school physics. Congratulations, you've done some machine learning. Or data science, depending on which angle we're talking about. A lot of regression techniques are uh, used in data science to analyze the data, to interpret and extract insights from. A lot of dimensionality reduction techniques are shared. But it, I, we keep coming back to the, the end result of machine learning is attempting to find ways to get computers to generalize from examples, using computation to extract general insight machines. And it uh, doesn't work that well. No, it works very well in some specific circumstances. And depending on time, I'll get into some of those. And if not, uh, call out for our uh, talk, the ATB talk, the Tech on Tap talk. We're going to be going through machine learning fails. One of my favorite things is to poke fun at machine learning. So we're going to go through a series of examples of all the various ways things can go wrong. It is a transformative and very important technology. My words to the contrary. Deep learning is the other thing that's in the news a lot today because deep learning is driving a lot of the current successes of machine learning. Important things to know about deep learning. It is not artificial intelligence. It is not machine learning. It's not even the be all and end all of those fields. It's one specific learning algorithm. And we saw in that diagram before, the learning algorithm is what generates the question answering machine. Deep learning is one family of techniques for generating question answering machines that are generally speaking neural networks. One specific technique. Why is it in the news so much now, and why is it conflated with AI? It gets good results. It gets good results because it's an extremely powerful technique. It can find almost arbitrarily complicated question answering machines, which is exactly what you need when you have to find a really complicated, you have a complex question to answer, but it only works if you have enough data to support it. And the more complex a solution you're looking for, generally speaking, the more data you need. So a lot of the companies we end up talking to, they want to dive into deep learning first of all, because it's what's in the news. And we come back again and again to the point that you do not have enough data to do a good job of this. Deep learning is working really well now because we have these massive, massive data repositories. And especially companies like Google have access to billions of examples. So one of our professors, Michael Bowling, talks about how you should really only consider deep learning when you have essentially an infinite source of data. So AlphaGo was one of the uh, really had huge impact in the news uh, advances in AI in the recent years. This was because the game of Go is an incredibly complicated problem. If you wanted to describe it perfectly, it would take more state space, it would take more bits than there are atoms in the universe. So it's impossible to solve perfectly using old classic AI techniques. It's physically impossible. There will never exist a computer that can solve that problem. Deep learning has way surpassed human expert play in Go. And the first iteration, AlphaGo used, well, both iterations used reinforcement learning, which is what we're going to be talking about shortly. It learned from self-play. Because you could define the rules of the game, you can just set that computer, well, many, many computers, running off in a corner, playing game after game after game against itself. And they were terrible games for the first billion iterations because they didn't know much of what was going on, especially Alpha Zero, but I'll come back to that. So because the rules of the game are really well-defined, you can have endless simulation data, you can get superhuman performance in that case. In the case of poker, we used a totally different approach because you can't, well, yeah. And in the case of um, some of the applications I'm gonna talk about, the question of how do you get enough data to do a good job is really the critical piece for deciding if you have reinforcement learning, if reinforcement learning is the right approach. So we'll come back to that. But the main lesson here is deep learning is one specific type of family of machine learning algorithms. It's really powerful when you have a ton of data and also a lot of computational power. All right, machine learning. There are three types of machine learning. Supervised learning, 
is when you have, oh, sorry, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. We break these in, uh, the approaches into these three categories, although there's a ton of overlap, and for any given problem, you're probably pulling on aspects of, from all of them. But it's useful to think about it in these three different ways. And one of the biggest reasons it's useful to think about this is because depending on the kind of data you have access to, you're dealing with a different kind of problem. So in the case of supervised learning, you are learning from correct examples. Just like Steve was talking about, you can't do supervised learning unless you have a labeled data set. And those labels can be generated from human experts, they can be generated from history, historical interactions, but to build a supervised learning system, which is by far the most powerful and reliable uh, family of techniques we have, you have to have the labeled data. And then you will let the machine do the computation to find out the best way to answer those questions given this description, given this correct mapping. Unsupervised learning is learning from unlabeled data. We're very clever with our names. Unlabeled data still has insights. There's still things you might want to find out. And it's unsupervised learning that has the highest overlap with data science. Because a lot of the techniques are about, for example, reducing the dimensionality. You have thousand dimensional inputs, say you have all the features describing the state of your field, the water levels, the, the fertilization history, the uh, soil quality, the seeds that were planted over 10 years and 20 years and 30 years of the history of that field. That's actually really highly high dimensional data. It's impossible for humans to visualize. We see in two dimensions extremely well, in three dimensions sort of, and in four not at all. So in order to make sense of the massive amounts of data we're collecting, you either have to use your domain expertise to say these are the things you should care about, so only look at those values and then look for trends, or you need to use some techniques to reduce the size of the data. A lot of this is about taking multi-dimensional data and turning it into two dimensions so we can look at it and know what it means. And that's exactly data science and machine learning working together. You can extract patterns from data in that case. Are they the correct patterns? I don't know. It depends. If you depend, it depends if you took the right family of techniques, and there is no way of knowing what the right answer. If you really, really want to be building a system that answers an exact correct question, or answers a question exactly correctly, then what you're talking about is a supervised learning problem, and you need to find your labeled data. The last type, which is what I'm going to spend most on now, reinforcement learning. This is, uh, came out of psychology and still has high overlap with psychology. Richard Sutton, who's a professor at the University of Alberta, is the, he doesn't like being called the father of reinforcement learning. He's the uh, major advocate and developer of. <laughs> He's a delightful person. So um, reinforcement learning wears a lot of different hats, but in, under this framework, the idea is you're learning from experience. You're learning from interaction. And one other difference is, you're not learning from experiences in somebody's telling you what the right answer was every time you do something. All you get is what's called a reward signal. So, let's talk about this. In two slides, I'm going to explain everything you need to know about reinforcement learning, except how to implement projects successfully. Here's the canonical example of reinforcement learning. It's called a grid world. We're the little black square over in the corner. We're trying to find our path through the maze. We start on the S for start. And the goal is that green glob labeled G. Don't know anything about the world. Don't know anything about Cartesian coordinates. Don't know that moving up changes your number in this way. All we have is a list of, here's the box you're in right now. You're in box number one. And you got zero reward. And then it's going to take an action, and now it's going to be in box 17 and get zero reward until it happens to stumble onto the goal state. So because this particular algorithm starts with no knowledge about the environment at all, it's just moving randomly right now. It's moving randomly around this very small world, and then it finds the goal state. And once it finds the goal state, you can see that green color start to fill in. The green is representing the agent's estimate of the goodness of each location. So those locations close to the goal are really good because you get a reward of one when you get to the goal. And then you teleport back to the start state and have to find your way again. Over time, in the limit, uh, this will find the optimal path to the goal in any maze. It's not as sample efficient as the search algorithms 
because it's not incorporating any information about the environment at all. One of the reasons we like this framework is because it can deal with situations like this. We just changed the environment. The goal is no longer where it thought it was. It's puttering around in that area because that used to be a really high value place to be. It used to be close to the action that would lead you to the magical one reward. It actually has to unlearn what it learned about that previous location. But then once it does and it finds the goal again, it can update its, its internal map. So the green is representing the value function, the estimate of how good it is to be in each of these locations. The only observations it's, it gets is, are what grid square it's in. And from that and the reward signal, it can find shortest path to the goal in any maze. And it's provably optimal if you're interested in that kind of thing under certain circumstances. Any questions? Mm -hmm. It's not a negative number in this case. You could give a reward of negative one on each step, and then you get slightly different behaviors. When you're actually defining reinforcement learning problems, a big part of the definition is deciding what your reward function should be. And so when we're going through some real examples, I'll talk a little bit more about reward function definition. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the policy is the, well, we, the technical term for how the agent decides how it wants to behave. In this case, it uses the value function, the estimate of how good each place is, to say, in this square, you should go towards higher value states. I mean, that's the fundamental principle of reinforcement learning. Take the action that will lead you to higher valued states. So the arrow is just showing, in this case, what the best action is. The agent isn't actually incorporated. Like, when we see arrows on the screen, we think, oh, yes, I will move down. They're unlabeled actions. There's no notion of geography or geometry in this, in this particular representation. Any others? Uh, this is DynaQ, if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. We like doing uh, Dyna so that you can actually see it learning. Uh, Dyna is a particular alg algorithm, family of algorithms, where you memorize experience, the agent stores experience and replays it so that for each step it takes in the physical world, it can actually update its mental model a bunch. This is very useful for live demos of reinforcement learning. Yeah, it's trapped. It's just gonna keep bouncing back and forth. It actually, this particular agent doesn't have an option of not taking an action. Sometimes it's bumping into walls and just not moving though. Any other questions? Is it From 50 to several billion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Isn't that a helpful answer? <laughs> oh, sorry, the question was how many iterations does it take to learn something useful? The other thing I want to stress is in this illustration, it starts with no knowledge, as I keep stressing, flogging a dead horse here. But the, that's not an essential characteristic of reinforcement learning. That's kind of a common myth about reinforcement learning that you have to do trial and error. It can, it learns from experience, it doesn't have to learn from nothing. So alpha zero, or sorry, alpha go did start with some pre-coded information about the opening book for go, some human, hard won human knowledge about what the best actions were. Alpha zero, which now beats the pants off alpha go, go started with no knowledge whatsoever. Because we're doing an, in an environment that we know can change, this is actually set to not always do the perfect action. So the arrows show its estimate of what the best action is, and I forget how ties are broken in this case. But it wasn't always behaving in that way. Any guesses as to why? Ex Somebody's taken RL before? <laughs> Exploration. I said the environment can change. If you just always do the action that was perfect as you've learned so far, you'll never explore the world. You'll never see that great thousand reward state just around the corner. Again, not a requirement for a reinforcement learning agent that it do random exploration, but often the right thing to do. And even with the deep learning models that DeepMind is using, like the ones for AlphaGo and AlphaZero, they had to actually ensure that the exploration always happened. It deliberately was designed to not always take what it thought was the best action. And it performed better in the long run in this case. 
In the case of Go, because, I, well, there's a lot of investigation into why, but partly because it's such an incredibly complex environment that you never actually have a perfect representation. You never know for sure the most perfect action to take in every case. Most perfect. Okay. <laughs> there, that's the video illustrating reinforcement learning. This is the technical diagram. The extent of math in this talk is just that there's capital letters with subscripts. <laughs> it's math. This is called the agent environment interface. It's kind of the core idea when you're defining a reinforcement learning problem. So when you're defining a reinforcement learning problem, you are an agent operating in some environment who receives observations, outputs actions, and gets back rewards and observations. In the perfect case, those observations exactly encapsulate everything you need to know about the state, about the, about the current situation in the environment. So in the case of the grid world, all you have to know is the unique label for that square. And that will tell you enough that you can learn an optimal policy. In the case of Go, it's this incredibly complex deep learning neural network model of, of what's going on, which may or may not exactly capture everything you need to know. The closer you can get to that, the better your learning is likely to be. And generally, we talk about it as proceeding over time. Um, so that you're in some, you've received some observations, you know something about the world, you choose an action, you get some reward in return, and then you're in a new situation in the world. Choose an action, get reward, so on till the end of time. Mm. In the classes, when Rich is going through this with the students, he can sometimes have kind of lengthy debates about where exactly this boundary is between the agent and environment. And I don't necessarily buy this as a deep philosophical description of the world. But the important things when you're looking at the task definition are what are the decision points the agent can make? That's your action space. And the question about what the state space is, or what observations can your agent make? That's your state space. You hope that it captures everything you need to know about the world. If you know it doesn't, then you need a complex modeling function like a, a deep learning model, which is why deep re reinforcement learning is very successful these days. And all of these are variables you can tweak as a RL practitioner trying to use RL, IRL. Okay. Questions about the theory? Excellent. Yeah, so the question is, in, in, in a lot of machine learning applications, you have correct answers, if I can paraphrase. The, and in the real world, it's a heck of a lot more complicated than that, than that. This is why I'm personally interested, my research area as a student has been in reinforcement learning, because reinforcement learning gets closer to the core of the problem. Children do not learn to recognize dogs by seeing one million dogs, <laughs> pictures of dogs, and then and then do math in their heads. <laughs> they... <laughs> and that's not even how our brains work. We know quite a bit how our brains work, and we know you don't have to see a million examples of something to know anything at all about it. Uh, the machine learning fails talk will go through several examples of how, how critical this difference is. So we know you can learn from incorrect, unlabeled data, and we still learn to act correctly. Reinforcement learning came out of psychology partly in response to this. The idea is that you don't have yes or no, right or wrong answers. You don't know, I don't know that I should move over here in this moment. I didn't even know that I should drive to Calgary. Nobody told me I made the correct choice at every instance of my life. But I do get some signals, generally speaking, pain, <laughs> pleasure, uh, reproduction, if you want to go that way. The, uh, <laughs> The reward signal actually captures this kind of vagary a little bit more. We don't know what the real life reward signal is, and there are really fascinating discussions about how we can encapsulate that, uh, kind of the complexity of human behavior in a single signal. But the really remarkable thing is we can get impressive behavior from not something that tells you what the correct answer was, but something that says, eh, 
you did okay, or, or great job, or mm. It doesn't even have to tell you that there are better options out there. Reinforcement learning doesn't rely on knowing that there's a maximum reward out there and finding it. It just gives a signal, signal on every step. And that's enough information to actually build pretty impressive applications. So let's go to some. Tara, my uh, machine learning educator, not mine personally, but Amy's, uh, is going to be manning the, oh, sorry, command tab to, We've got to get out of full screen mode uh, to pull up the videos because I didn't have the YouTube Grabber app. Question? I was just wondering if you would get the difference between the statements in the environment instead of being like a non dual thing where there's So, yeah, if I reject the agent environment interface on a philosophical level because it's a non dual thing. The best explanation I have for this is when we were looking at designing a robot. So, we built this robot called Critterbot, it did nothing at all. I mean, nothing functional, it just lived. It had some sensors about the environment, it could take actions, it had omnidirectional wheels. And as we were building it, we continuously were facing the question of what is the action space? Should the action space be, I send commands to the motor? You can start playing this, actually. In, the, in this robot, this incredibly important application of pancake flipping. Oh, you got it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> incredibly important application. What is the action space? Shout out some options. The server motor, yeah. So charge to the motors, send a current, and the motor will activate. Anything else? Any roboticist in the office, in the room? They'll have. Roboticists will tell you the actions are move to this location in space. And frankly, I'm not sure which this, well, no, I'm almost certain this is the wham arm. It's using not actuate those motors, but move to this location. Those are both entirely valid action sets. You can't actually guarantee you're moving, so I could say my action is to go to the door. And then it will be a stochastic action. It won't always succeed the same way. So the action environment boundary moves, or the agent environment boundary moves depending on your perspective, even as you're defining the problem. So this particular pancake flipper only took 50 trials to learn. But it did start, notice it started from human demonstration. The person was actually moving the robot arm in the right motions. From that, it's actually unconstrained learning. So if we were doing this purely as a supervised learning approach, we would say the way that arm moved when the human was moving it was the right way to do it. So you should learn a mapping from all of the information you can gather to that right way. And then the performance will be capped as realistically, slightly lower than the best human performance. Whereas in the reinforcement learning framework, you give it reward for successfully flipping the pancake and then let her rip. It can try anything. It will eventually be surpassing all human expertise in pancake flipping yes. of particular cardboard marked fake pancakes. Yeah. Because probably once you put the real batter in there, the emotions are going to have to adjust a little bit. Okay. Critical. This is probably one of the most famous applications of reinforcement learning in real life. It's the Google DeepMind server farms. So DeepMind, although it's, it's the heavy research arm of a heavy research arm of Google, pretty much paid for itself with this one demo. So this was taking a reinforcement learning algorithm, I believe it was deep learning too, and letting it control the power in a server farms. Server farms generate enough heat to match the surface of the sun if they run unconstrained. Obviously, this is not good for your hardware, so you should maybe have a cooling system in there and maybe adjust the power flow. So they trained, I think using a simulator, to control the, when, the, when the coolant was on and when it wasn't and had a 40% overall, 40% reduction in the power costs of Google server farms. That's probably more than the output of several cities. All right, what is our next example? Oh, this was a new one to me. So this is actually optimizing chemical reactions using reinforcement learning. So in order to do a reinforcement learning problem, you have to set up in this agent environment framework. So the actions in this case are, uh, I think, temp temperature? 
you can take any of the environmental conditions. I am not a chemist, but I re vaguely remember heat being relevant and catalysts and stuff. So all that stuff you can change in order to improve reactivity, you can treat that as an action that a reinforcement learning agent can control. And then your reward function, again, not a chemist, presume would be efficiency of reaction, quantity of output. Set that up as a reinforcement learning system, feed it into any reinforcement learning algorithm, and eventually um, see, find the best actions to take. Again, not dependent on human labels, not dependent on being handed the correct answer, just from the reward signal. All right? Oh, yeah. This one I've been seeing since, when was the latest? 2006? It's a recurring theme of using reinforcement learning to control traffic lights. Um, it's kind of perfect because what's the action space for traffic lights? Free. <laughs> Red, green, yellow, in our country anyway. I don't know how long, how, if anyone has shared this experience of sitting at a traffic light when nobody is anywhere and being like, why am I stopped? Surely there's a better solution. This has driven a lot of reinforcement learning researchers to apply reinforcement learning to traffic light optimization. This, as far as I know, is not technically implemented in the real world, but you can drastically increase I think this starts by only allowing vertical traffic, which has a pretty simple optimal policy. If there's only traffic going one way, what's the optimal policy? Green! <laughs> Green everywhere. But here they do different models of bursty traffic, uh, and eventually they're gonna have some traffic going the other way, in which case they have to allow, let it through. Okay, I think I won't say much about that one. Uh, where's the last? How are we doing for, oh, shoot. Yeah, I'm totally talking fast, okay. I have seen reinforcement learning applied to recommendation systems because the reward, oh yeah, we'll play the car. This is a terrifying one to watch. So this is, <laughs> that brave human driver is providing a correction And the reward signal is based on how long could you go before I had to take over. And so in this case, it actually learns in not too many episodes. Autonomous driving is a very hard problem. Please don't get into a car that's only been trained on a day of, ex of experiments. <laughs> but when, it, when you're able to, actually this speaks to Steve's point about human in the loop. This is another way we have human in the loop. Don't think about how you have to take humans out of the equation entirely and create an AI system that completely replaces them. Think about how you can collaboratively work. In this case, the human is basically working as a very brave driver's ed teacher and providing the training data. Um, almost every autonomous car company is doing reinforcement learning in some form or another. Uber, I couldn't find a video of it, but Uber was using Grand Theft Auto as a test bed for simulating data to build a controller, reinforcement learning, using reinforcement learning to build a controller in Grand Theft Auto, which creates a driver that is very good in Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> so the, I read the headline, I was like, I'm not getting in an Uber ever. <laughs> it's really important that the, uh, going back to our picture about using the, looking at where your model is going to be used and how you build it, it's really important that your learning data cover all the cases, you can think of all the cases that you want covered in the operational data. And this is another complexity and expense in getting enough data because this trained on this road, this English looking road is uh, not gonna do so well on ice, black ice in Edmonton or Calgary. If it hasn't actually been trained on that, day, on that environment, it's unlikely it's going to work. Um, yeah, okay, so we've seen, I've seen, I don't have demos for, but recommendation systems that are tuned using a simple reinforcement learning ac algorithm give the system reward when it gives a recommendation you liked. Give it a penalty when it gives a recommendation you don't, and then let it optimize. Uh, Chatbot systems, although they have to pull in a lot of other technologies too, because of course you have to have a lot of natural language processing going on in that case. 
Uh, what else? Oh, process control. So we have some projects looking at applying reinforcement learning in factories. This is another case where, in this particular case, we're doing a water, uh, the um, wash schedule for a water treatment plant. So when, when the filter should be cleaned, which costs something and you have to stop pushing water through, but it can really extend the life of the filter. So this is great, we have historical data, we can learn something from that, and then we hit a roadblock because we need that simulator. We need, ultimately we need to be able to interact with the world in order to get the experience we really need because we need to know how, how well is this agent behaving in the real world. So that requires building a simulated environment where we can gather data where the agent itself has control. And the Waze example where the human took over, that was, um, a good innovation for how to actually get real world data without endangering your very expensive autonomous car. Because it's hard to back up death. So, this is actually a workshop that's coming up June 14th at the International uh, Conference on Machine Learning uh, by actually all our uh, University of Alberta's previous uh, graduates. They are going to be posting their papers, and it looks like a really interesting slate. So if you're interested in applicate real life IRL applications of RL, uh, check this out. And I'm going to provide Drew with the slides so you actually have access to links too. OK, any questions? Mm -hmm. Ooh. You can, yeah, how does reinforcement learning compare to traditional control methods? There's a lot of back and forth because reinforcement learning is about rather than coming up with the fixed policy that is the right way be to behave, define the reward signal so that it will find the best way to behave, the best set points or the best interactions. Um, same problem trying to be solved almost all the time. And some techniques have been stolen from each other. A lot of analysis has been borrowed from each other. And it's coming at it from such different perspectives that there's also a lot of headbutting between researchers in those fields. But that's, that's, the, uh, that's almost the canonical example of reinforcement learning. So I think there's a ton of potential, even on, like on PID controllers, on robots, and yeah. 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 Yeah, you can either like try to translate what we know from control theory about the actual underlying and Markov decision process or the model of the process and use that as a model in reinforcement learning, or you can do model-free methods and say, okay, I'm just getting this reward signal, take your inputs, pick actions, and I'm never actually building a model of the environment. And so there's always back and forth in the reinforcement learning community, community between model-free and model-based. But it's a, it's a different perspective. And can work, also can not work sometimes, so. If you have a good description of the state space, then we have amazing proof that in, given enough data, you'll find the perfect solution. The problem we run into is the models that we've come up with in order to use kind of traditional control theory models are, are idealized models. And so the gap between the idealized models and the real life experience can in some cases be devastating. Yeah. It's stochastic process or you're learning and you're finding the best thing in a model that isn't actually the real situation. But they can be combined. I mean, oftentimes that's where, or either build a simulator with the model to jumpstart training or give the agent the model and let it tweak the parameters. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap there. 